Sup, you beautiful bastards? Hope you've had a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we have to talk about today is the crazy story around the now ousted mayor of a small Michigan town. The now former mayor, Elijah Daniel, who before taking office tweeted, if Donald Trump, a reality star, can be our president, there's no reason why I can't be a politician, made waves with a big controversial move. Yesterday, Daniel signed an official declaration banning heterosexuals from the town. The declaration reading, as of today, I am establishing new vetting measures to keep radical heterosexuals out of our town. We want to ensure that we are not admitting into our town the very heterosexual threats we are fighting against. The straights coming into our town, procreating, having more straight children to take our rightfully gay jobs. We only want to admit those into our town who will support our town and love deeply our people. I currently feel as if it would just be safer to ban all heterosexuality until we can assess the situation further and build a strategy to resolve our problem. Later noting in the declaration that if you are straight and you live there, you can pay an $84,000 reproductive precautionary deposit. This would be returned after one year of heterosexual abstinence. Also noting that the town would be offering a heterosexual reparative therapy program. It's not mandatory, but highly encouraged. And soon after, in an unsurprising move, the mayor was impeached. And I say unsurprisingly for two reasons. One, any politician throwing down stuff like this is insane and should not be in power. And two, this is what Elijah signed up for. And I actually mean literally, like he actually signed up for and paid $100 to do this. Now keep in mind, there are people still outraged by this, but it was all a joke. There's a town in Michigan called Hell. You can actually pay to be mayor of hell for a day. And then from the photos we see this is exactly what Elijah did. Also if you go to the town's website which has around like 72 people, seems like the town is essentially just a gimmick, a tourist trap. You've got the Hellhole Diner, Damnation University where you can get a degree. You can even get married in hell so you can be like we got married in hell and then that never gets old at every party for the rest of your life. But you get the point. Still the story with Elijah Daniel made not only national but international news. Elijah by the way if you don't know at this point is a, is a big YouTuber. The whole thing's joke but there were still so many people that were angry. Let's look at a few of them. Elijah, so oppressing straight people is okay, but oppressing gay people isn't okay? Makes sense. Another writing, yo, if Hell Michigan banned the gays for a day, all hell would break loose. But the straights are fair game, hashtag double standards. And here's what I'll say, I understand why people are gonna say that this is a double standard, that if you switch the situation, people would be furious. But I think it's important to have context and situational awareness. We live in a country where only recently we decided that same-sex couples could legally get married. We live in a world where there are certain countries where they will kill you if if you are gay. I've never heard of a country that jails you if you want to have sex with the opposite gender. It's a joke. It's a joke that's supposed to be so ridiculous that it reflects in some way on the ridiculousness of a different situation. Right? When the former gayer Elijah Daniel tweets, I don't care if you're straight, just don't want you doing it in front of my kids. That's a joke aimed at people who say the same thing about gay people. In Elijah's official declaration banning heterosexuals, it's a joke because he uses the same phrasing of Trump with his Muslim but not a Muslim travel ban. It's just jokes with no real world impact. We've just got to stop being so uptight. But of course, this is the Philip DeFranco show. It's not just the story. It's not just my opinion. I want you to chime in. What are your thoughts here? Hilarious, stupid, or offensive? And then let's talk about the controversy and outrage around Joel Osteen. Joel is a multimillionaire televangelist with a super church in Houston that can house around 16,000 people. Houston, of course, was ravaged by Hurricane Harvey. It was massively flooded, and there were tons of people displaced. And so on August 27th, Osteen's church, Lakewood Church, put out a Facebook post saying, Dear Houstonians, Lakewood Church is inaccessible due to severe flooding. We wanna help make sure you are safe. Please see the list below for safe shelters around our city and please share this with those in need. Then providing a list of shelters in the area for those who have been displaced. Then on the 28th, the Lakewood Church does another Facebook post. This time Joel and his wife Victoria Osteen put out a link where people can donate money and they write, our hearts are breaking as we see the images of the damage and destruction in our city and the surrounding areas from Hurricane Harvey. We are praying for everyone's safety in Houston and Texas. As a community, we can help each other get through this storm. Adding, we are working diligently with a city of Houston to mobilize our many volunteers at shelters around the city. But then something interesting happened. People around Osteen's church went there to see what the flooding looked like and they found no flooding. And keep in mind, a good number of these are from before Lakewood Church wrote that second update. Charles Clymer posting this picture front of Joel Osteen's huge Lakewood Church in Houston at 11 a.m. Closed due to, quote, flooding. Person who took it asked to be anonymous. Then providing more close-up photos of what seems to be zero flooding whatsoever. More and more people started going to the Lakewood Church, taking photos, taking video. And very quickly, there was massive internet outrage because it looked like Joel Osteen and his church lied. Many saying, why are you saying your church was inaccessible due to flooding? There is none. How dare you? You run a place of worship that can house 16,000 people when there are tens of thousands of displaced people and you're lying to keep your doors closed? And it was reported that rather than respond to many of these people on Twitter, Joel Osteen or whoever was running his account, we don't know, they started blocking the people that were sending them critical responses. Also some, like Lynn Gabrielle Kane, tried to come to the defense of the church, tweeting out these images 
images with the caption, seriously quite sickening when people spread negative news without knowing the situation. This is the situation of our church. But people are quick to point out that these photos seem to be from the parking garage and underground areas. So unless all these displaced people had cars that they needed to park, which really wasn't the case for many, that wasn't a valid defense. And the church responds to the backlash saying they are prepared to house people once other shelters hit capacity. Still, a lot of people said this is too little too late. And then Joel Osteen did a TV interview. And in it, he seems to dismiss what he is calling a false narrative that he closed his door. And also he tries to explain of why they were not a shelter sooner. Why did the church wait until yesterday to start taking in people? Well, our church, our church doors have always been open. In fact, we, we took people in right when the water started to recede. So right off the bat, I'll say that's a pretty odd claim because there's actual video on the internet of someone going up to the church trying to open the door. It is locked. The place doesn't appear flooded, but I'll let Joel continue. Why wouldn't the house of, of worship open its doors immediately, initially, even perhaps before some of the other shelters? We're all about helping people. This is what the, the church is and our church is all about. So I think it's, I don't know if it's unfounded, but I think if people were here, they'd realize there were safety issues. This building had flooded before. And so we were just being precautious. But the main thing is the city didn't ask us to become a shelter then. And so that note of the city didn't ask us, that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. We had stories that we talked about like yesterday where a business owner, Mattress Mac, he opened up his store to people that were displaced. There were also other places of faith in Houston that transformed themselves into 24 hour relief centers. I saw at least four Houston area mosques that did so. And according to a writer from Mike.com, Anna Swartz, she tweeted, I spoke to the president of the Islamic Society of Greater Houston yesterday. They weren't asked to turn mosques into shelters, they just did it. But also in Joel's defense, it's kind of like what the Bible says in Matthew 25, 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me, dot, dot, dot. Obviously after you were asked to do so and not of your own free will. Hashtag dab on them haters, Matthew out. And if you're wondering, Yes, that is 100% an accurate reading of the Bible. If you don't know that, maybe read the Bible, sinner, okay? But back to the interview, Joel says they also didn't have the manpower. It's easy to say, wow, there's that big building, they're not using it, but we don't have volunteers and we don't have staff that could get here, so... We're all about helping the city whenever we could. If they would ask us to become a shelter early on, we would have prepared for it all and been ready to help. But hey, thank God we can do it now and help the city you know, in this way. And on that note, I would say that's pretty confusing that he's saying that. Because in the update post on their Facebook signed by Joel and Victoria Osteen, they write, we are working diligently with the city of Houston to mobilize our many volunteers at shelters around the city. And there were also all those images from the 28th that appeared to show no flooding that would impede people from arriving. I'm not gonna go as far as others saying that Joel Osteen is a wolf in sheep's clothing, that he's a predator that preys on people by using their faith against them just so he can make himself richer, that he cares about money more than people, and you can see that because he started raising funds on their own website rather than publicly opening their doors to the displaced and needy. But I will say it doesn't look great for Joel, and uh, it does seem like from those interviews that it, they're really in damage control mode. But also, I want to know your opinion. Do you think that Osteen's in the wrong here, that just trying to make good? Let me know what you think. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today, and today in awesome, brought to you by the sports shirt. The shirt that says, I don't understand what's happening, the rules, how things are scored, but our team is better than the other team. And also, thank you for inviting me to this party. I'm a fan of free food. Why buy a $140 official tee when you get an all-encompassing tee? If you want to snag one from this run, link to that down below. And the first bit of awesome and oh my god I'm so excited it's coming back we got a trailer for Mr. Robot season 3. Also for those of you that have not watched the show yet I highly recommend you check it out. Then we had Life Noggin answering one of life's most important questions. What would happen if you never showered? Then we got a fantastic video from Nerdwriter. One it's a fantastic channel in general if you're a fan of entertainment. And two they just put out a very interesting video about The Handmaid's Tale and Shallow Focus. Then we got a fantastic live action trailer for Destiny 2. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared the secret link of the day anything at all links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about this story that has blown up out of Georgia about this police officer caught on dash cam reportedly saying, quote, we only kill black people. So obviously that headline makes you go, what? What in the actual hell? So l let's look at it. The dash cam footage starts off with the officer telling a woman to call someone and tell them to not pick her up because she's being arrested and the car is being impounded. She seems incredibly nervous and then this back and forth happens. Use your phone. It's in your lap okay, right there. I just don't want to put my hands down. I'm really sorry. I'm just Black. Remember, we only kill black people. Yeah, we only kill black people, right? All the videos you've seen, have you seen any white people get killed? Yeah. Now, 
response to all of this, Cobb County Police Chief Mike Register and his command staff looked at the footage and the officer involved was placed on administrative leave while they investigated. Chief Register is saying, no matter what the context, statements like these are unacceptable and are not indicative of the type of culture we are trying to facilitate here in the police department. Also in response to the situation, Abbott's attorney released a statement saying, his comments must be observed in their totality to understand their context. He was attempting to de-escalate the situation involving an uncooperative passenger. In context, his comments were clearly aimed at attempting to gain compliance by using the passenger's own statements and reasoning to avoid making an arrest. And the context angle is something others hit on, including the attorney for the driver who got the DUI. That attorney saying they were shocked by it and said, I heard that and I cringe. I had to replay it. I thought there's no way. But even the attorney here says they think that the police officer was being sarcastic, but adding that's still no excuse. Saying the reality is to us minorities, there is a real fear when you're pulled over. He thought it was a joke, but it's not a joke to many people. And this is where there's been a lot of debate because a lot of people are saying, okay, let's say he said it as a joke. Let's say he was being sarcastic. That's still not appropriate. Just a few of the big comments I've seen around this. No one should play about using racism as a form of sarcasm. There's been people who have died because the cop in question was being racist. The people who are defending him are immoral. If you see nothing wrong with the fact that he said they only kill black people, joking or not, that tells me a lot about you. Another writing, the problem with this is that even though many people believe that he's being sarcastic, it's inappropriate. As a professional, there's a fine line between being facetious and being insensitive. One of the most liked comments, of course, all the white people are making excuses for his ignorant and unprofessional comments. Such a shame, his racist behind doesn't deserve a badge, period. But there are also those defending the officer. One writing, that was sarcasm. For everyone who says that's racist, well, it's not. It's literally what all the mainstream media says. Cops only kill black people. Not true. Another writing, I don't think the cop was doing anything wrong except maybe he shouldn't have said what he said. But I do get it. It's not fair the way the media is blowing things out of proportion to promote the false idea that cops are trigger happy racists who target minorities. Police brutality is a real issue, but it's not about color. And so with this story, I want to pass the question off to you. Part of my brain goes, this is beneath what a police officer should be. But the other part of me goes, was he trying to de-escalate the situation about her, what he considered ridiculous fears, by taking a piece of her narrative and going, hey, look, in this ridiculous narrative, this wouldn't even apply to you anyway. I'd love to know your thoughts here. Do you think the cop was in the wrong, yes or no? Why? Also, if you think yes, what should the punishment be? I'd love to know what you're thinking. Then in kind of interesting local news that I just wanted to share, Los Angeles has become the largest city nationwide to remove Columbus Day as an official holiday and replace it. With a city council vote of 14 to one, Columbus Day has officially been changed to Indigenous People Day. Now keep in mind, LA is not the first city to do this. Seattle, Phoenix, Denver, Albuquerque, San Francisco, Portland, many other places have adopted this. And states including Alaska, South Dakota, Vermont have enacted similar changes. Now for those that don't know, Christopher Columbus is an Italian explorer who celebrated for discovering America. And he definitely didn't do anything else bad. But the fact is he's celebrated for something he didn't do and he was also a murdering psychopath. One, he never actually discovered America. He did get to what we would consider now Haiti, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic. Also, the places he discovered were already inhabited by a bunch of other people who he then enslaved and murdered in crazy numbers. And so I say this as an Italian and I grew up proud that Christopher Columbus was Italian. We helped make our mark on America. No, he, he is a, he's a lying, crazy monster. Keep the day as a federal holiday, but let's stop celebrating such a horrible person. And if anything, the celebration of the false idol that is Christopher Columbus takes away from the real contributions of Italian immigrants. People that came here to actually build and create something, not to murder and pillage. And then let's talk about the Lord of the Flies remake. Now to explain this story, I do have to say spoiler alert, to which some of you are gonna go, wait, you're issuing a spoiler alert for a movie that came out in 1990 about a book that came out in 1954? Yes, people are stupid and love to complain. To briefly sum up the story of Lord of the Flies, a group of boys are on a plane that crash lands on an island. They get their first leader of the group. He tries to get the other boys to perform important survival tasks, like keeping a signal fire going, alerting any passing ships, and building shelters. But instead, a lot of the boys like to play and hunt pigs. And eventually, the leader of the group is challenged, and it just spirals from there. And then, well, I, I don't actually want to ruin the, the book for those who haven't read it, or the movie for those who haven't watched it. I recommend it. It's pretty good. Well, here's the thing. In this remake, they want to change it from a group of boys to a group of girls. Scott McGahey and David Siegel are signed on to write and direct the movie. When asked about the movie, Siegel said, We want to do a very faithful but contemporized adaptation of the book, but our idea was to do it with all girls rather than boys. It is a timeless story that is especially relevant today, with the interpersonal conflicts and bullying and the idea of children forming a society and replicating the behavior they saw in grown-ups before they were marooned. And McGahey added that they were taking the opportunity to tell it in a way that hasn't been told before, with girls rather than boys, which shifts things in a way that might help people see the story anew. Now, to no one's surprise, there were many people outraged by this, but to the surprise of some, the people expressing their displeasure in this move come in all colors of the rainbow. We had anti-feminists and feminists alike saying this is stupid. And one of the reasons for that is William Golding, the author of the original book, said he specifically did it with boys rather than girls for a reason. He explained, if you, as it were, scale down human beings, scale down society, if you land with a group of
of little boys. They are more like a scaled down version of society than a group of little girls would be. This has nothing to do with equality at all. I think women are foolish to pretend they're equal to men. They are far superior and always have been. But one thing you cannot do with them is take a bunch of them and boil them down into a set of little girls who would then become a kind of image of civilization or society. So if people angry because they say the directors must have missed the point of the story, people angry because they say the storyline cannot be swapped by gender, and also the fact that this gender swap is happening with two men at the helm. Some examples of people sounding off. Troy writing, um, Lord of the Flies is about replication of systematic masculine toxicity. Every ninth grader knows this. You can read about it on Spark Notes. Rachel Leishman writing, The female-led Lord of the Flies would never happen because women just branch off into their own respective groups peacefully. To which I do want to call a reasonable amount of bullshit here. I've seen the way women and young girls fight and it is brutal. And I'm not talking about like on World Star. I've seen groups of women crush other women's souls just with words. It's not like women are immune to being on the giving end of anger and violence. But it should also be noted that there are people defending them. And the few that have been defending them are saying that by people getting angry about this move, are those people, are they perpetuating gender stereotypes that men are more aggressive than women? That men are more prone to acts of violence rather than rational conversation? And so shouldn't we welcome whatever this movie becomes because right now there is no script? But of course, at the same time, understandably, you have people saying, sure. Or is this just Hollywood being lazy and saying, what if we just uh, changed the remake into an all-female cast so we don't have to come up with original ideas? And I say personally, I always try to have the mindset of not to hate something before we know what it is exactly, but I will say right out of the gate, this doesn't seem promising. More than happy to be wrong about this, I would welcome that, but uh, for now it's gonna be a pass for me. And that's actually where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss these daily videos, which actually, if you did miss yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you wanna catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you wanna watch and maybe join the first episode of the DeFranco Book Club, click or tap right there. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you you tomorrow.